All right, thank you for coming. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, the keynotes this morning, this will be a talk mainly about Debian and open embedded, uh, Yocto, sort of, uh, and the whole development process from prototyping to commercialization, some issues to, to think about, benefits of each of them, concerns about each of them. Um, but it, additionally, just an introduction to the, the Snapdragon uh, 410 platform. Uh, so there's some, anyway, I'll get to the slides and I can explain it from there. Oh, here we are. So the 410E embedded platform uh, is the chip itself, uh, basically, and then there can be SOMs created from that and other boards, uh, but there's a, a reference board, the Dragon Board 410C development board, which is compliant with the 96 board spec. Uh, it's available from Arrow. Uh, Lenaro produces uh, software for it. There's a Debian build and a, uh, a, open, a open embedded build. So the, the 410E processor uh, basically has, it's a quad core Cortex A53. Um, it's got uh, integrated connectivity, Bluetooth, GPS, Wi-Fi. It has a hexagon DSP in it. Um, currently the builds for Open Embedded and uh, for Debian don't have uh, hexagon SDK um, compatibility. That's being worked on uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, that should also be available. Uh, there's a Adreno 306 GPU, which is supported by the open source Freedreno driver. And uh, then there's other, several other peripheral interfaces there at the bottom. Uh, so this is supported with an upstream kernel uh, for graphics, video acceleration, audio, I.O. Um, one thing that is different with the 410C than some of the other embedded boards is that it uses the Android um, uh, boot image format, and it uses the LK bootloader instead of uh, a grub or uh, RU boot, I should say. Uh, okay. So this is my last slide on the 410C, and then I'll get into the other parts. Uh, so the, the difference here, uh, the Snapdragon 410E part is a long-term availability part. So if you're prototyping something, building something today, that part's going to be around for uh, 10 years total. Um, if you're looking at prototyping, the Dragon Board 410C is a great platform to, to uh, take into your, your prototyping on. Uh, and they're both available. They'll be sold through Arrow. Uh, there's also a link there to other uh, embedded platforms if you want to see some of the other commercial options for getting the 410E. All right, so back to Debian. So let me start with just uh, giving you an overview of the Debian ecosystem, uh, some of the pros and cons. So Debian has a huge repository of pre-built packages. If you're trying to get up and running quickly, I mean, this is the benefit that people have seen with Raspberry Pi and many of the developer boards is, you don't have to build everything from scratch. You don't have to start and have a nine hour build time to get up and running with a root file system. You, you can uh, basically app get install all the things you need. Many things are prepackaged. At least the dependencies are there for, for other packages. Uh, and that's huge for prototyping. That's really going to save you some time. Uh, there's a very active community of, of supporters and contributors to Debian. Uh, they do a great job doing updates, uh, doing bug fixes, um, supporting uh, the releases, being transparent. They have a Debian social contract, which talks about how the Debian packages will remain open, how they will also allow for closed source packages uh, to be used with Debian, how um, any of those packages can be used not necessarily in the aggregate of Debian, but individually as well. It, it really lays out uh, all the things that are, are useful to understand how this can be used commercially. Um, the one th caveat I would, would say is if you don't have a long history and background in Debian with the package management and the sort of history and evolution of Debian, much of the documentation that's there is going to be very, very difficult because it presumes a lot of understanding of the different packaging um, uh, projects that have been there. They've evolved over time. Some of the documentation is a little stale. Uh, so those are the, some of the things you're going to find with Debian. Uh, yeah, 
so releases. So Debian uh, has, <coughs> excuse me, stable releases and testing releases. Uh, at any given time, there's one stable, one uh, testing release, which has the support of the Debian security team. And then when a new version is released, or when it evolves, when testing uh, moves to stable, there's um, usually about an additional year provided uh, for support for that from the Debian security team. However, there is another group, uh, the Debian long-term support um, group, which is extending the lifetime of Debian stable releases to at least five years. So this is really, really great for companies that need to provide long-term support for, um, for platforms. And this is also being looked at by uh, certain other projects like the uh, Civil Infrastructure Project. So the, the Debian build methodology typically has been uh, historically native build. If you have something that you want to build in Debian, you build it natively on the platform that it's on. It's either, if it's an ARM hard float, you build it on an ARM hard float, uh, ARM hard float platform, et cetera. Uh, and if, for instance, if you have uh, you know, a 410C or a, a Raspberry Pi, any of those boards, and you have a simple pro um, project that you want to build, it's simple to just build it on the board itself. Install all of the, the uh, necessary build uh, packages, build it easy, super simple. However, if you want to build Chrome, you're not going to do that on your Raspberry Pi. You're not going to do that on most embedded boards. Uh, if you're trying to build Clang, I don't even think you can link it on most of these boards. So one of the other things that people use is uh, uh, doing native build, but doing it in QMU. Then you have access to a lot more RAM. Uh, you can get all the, the packages installed. You basically create a sysroot uh, using multi-strap, and then you can install all the dependent packages that you need. Um, and basically, chroot into the chroot. You can bind map uh, all, everything you need so that you can just have network access and app get installed additional packages if you wanted. The, the caveat is that it runs about five times at least slower than your native system will, uh, and, and that's uh, the challenge. There is work going on, especially I believe in the Buster release, to improve um, the uh, cross-build capabilities of Debian. There is some that are there. Um, Debian also supports uh, multi-arch so that you can install other architectures. And so I could install the basic uh, glibc, other uh, packages, into my PC. So say I could do arch64 and load those packages in and build and link an application. But there's many problems where, for instance, say I need the uh, Python dev headers. And if I want to install those for a foreign architecture, they collide with the native ones. And so I can't actually install them. So uh, there are some, some problems just doing that. This cross build is not the same as that. There, it uses a sysroot approach as well. There are some things that are still broken. Um, but it seems like it's evolving. It seems like the story's improving. Uh, and I can't say that I have gone down that road because uh, it's fairly new, I think in the sense that it's, it, it may be more viable. So Deb package format, uh, for those not familiar with Debian, it's basically, um, it has your control files in it, that are in it. It has the description of the package dependencies. It has all of the packages laid out. There's uh, uh, lots of tools for querying the packages, installing them. Uh, it is a package format supported also by Yocto. Um, it's any Debian derivative like Ubuntu uses it as well. But there's a, a really confusing evolution of packaging helpers uh, to, to create these packages. And so one of the, the more recent ones is this git build package. If you have a git repository, you can use it to build a package. Uh, there was pbuilder, which I think is still used. There's sbuild, which I don't even have any idea what it is because I've never used that. Uh, and then there's dh, which is basically deb helper 7. So you'll see references to these if you're reading the Debian documentation. Uh, and this is sort of the, the big learning curve part if you're really trying to get into that. I mean, typically the, the Debian methodology is you would create a source package. And then the source package would be compiled and generate the binary package, which you would then deploy. However, if you have binaries that are pre-generated, that are closed source, uh, that you need to repackage into your system, uh, that's not typically the Debian methodology, and it is not a really good fit there. 
So some of the things I've done in the past is just basically create my own control file, install the files into that, uh, and then run dpackage deb build uh, just to package it up with the necessary dependencies, and then I can integrate it into my system. I can, app, I can install it, uninstall it, and it, it makes it much cleaner than just throwing a tarball in uh, to the system. So Debian, uh, very, very friendly terms for commercial deployment. Uh, some links there. If you are rolling something out and you don't want necessarily just a, an apt update um, and an apt upgrade and get it, all the different packages, if you need to have you know, a tested release be uh, deployed at any moment in time, you can pin packages uh, if you want, so you don't have to pick up certain packages. Um, but you may want to control when an update can be done, uh, if not allowing, obviously, root access and, and not allowing uh, anyone to just do uh, an apt update, an app upgrade. There are some license compliance tools that are there that are mainly done for the overall uh, Debian repository. There are some tools that are available if you're creating an application that will go through and find out what all your dependencies are and then tell you what those licenses are. Uh, so if you're doing license compliance uh, for your product, Obviously, this is a big, important thing. Uh, and having five years of support is a huge benefit uh, of, of Debian. Um, currently, the Lonaro build for 410C is based on Debian testing. So if you're prototyping now, and depending on the life cycle of your prototyping phase, uh, if you plan to roll out on stable, it's actually a, a good pipeline rather than rolling out on stable and uh, eating up a year of your support time. All right, so I'll switch over to uh, Yocto Open Embedded. Um, so there's maybe some confusion as to what's the difference between Yocto and Open Embedded. So there's a couple <clears throat> good sites I found. Uh, strangely, Wikipedia actually gives you a fairly good description of, sort of the layers and the, the way that this works. Um, there's basically what Open Embedded is, is a series of layers of recipes in order to build packages that then can be brought together to create a root file system that you can then deploy. Um, uh, Kun Kui uh, has a, a really good uh, slides there that describe the terminology of this if you're interested in, uh, in understanding more or, or you, if you find any of the terms confusing. Um, but just to, to cut to the chase here, Basically, Open Embedded is a build system that's based on BitBake, which is a, a way to, to build the packages um, from these recipes. Open Embedded is not a distro. Uh, it's just made up of collections of recipes for BitBake organized by layers. So what is Yocto? Well, Yocto basically provides a reference distro that's built with Open Embedded, but it adds a lot of additional tools and recipes, um, which I'll get into some of them. Uh, so one of the big benefits of Open Embedded or Yocto is if you're building products that are cost sensitive and you really need to reduce flash, reduce RAM, reduce the bomb cost, and you're super sensitive to the size of your root file system image, this is going to be better for you than a typical Debian system, which may have many more um, uh, base packages or package dependencies. You have flexibility, you have control. You can decide what options you want to enable in a package when you build it. Uh, you can build with BusyBox versus a, a set of other packages. Um, you can choose whatever tool chain you want. You're not stuck with the tool chains that are available in that particular release of, of Debian, for instance. They provide tools for software compliance. Uh, you can basically generate an XPDX report uh, that will tell you what of all the different packages are from uh, the, your root file system and its dependencies out. Uh, sometimes that's needed if you're providing things in a supply chain. But Yocto and Open Embedded have a huge learning curve for anyone who has not used it before. Uh, it is basically um, going to be a whole different way of, of doing things from just basically taking a root file system and pointing your sysroot there with your compiler and building. You have all these recipes, you have Python layers that build it. Uh, I have definitely had to dive into the Python layers a bit baked to debug things and builds. Um, so that is the challenge with it. 
Uh, it also takes a long time to build the images, uh, depending on how big, if you want one with X11 and a bunch of extra packages, and depending on the speed of your machine, it can take, uh, it's taking me up to like nine hours to build a root file system image. Uh, and if you want to change something and tweak the configuration of your build, you may end up regenerating the entire build again. So there, there is lots of, uh, of challenges with this, um, but you get the flexibility that you need. It also uh, requires lots of storage and processing power. You definitely want to share by disk when you're starting to work with this kind of system. So, when I, when I adopt this, what am I getting myself into? Uh, so basically, if you're using Debian, you're installing packages, and you're, you have a platform that developers can target, and someone can write a, a third-party package, they know how it's gonna run, they know what the dependent libraries are, when you are using Open Embedded, you're building your own distro. You are your distro maintainer unless you're, unless you're getting Open Embedded or Yocto from someone like a Mentor Graphics or someone else. Uh, you control the system updates. You control getting all those critical fixes in there um, and when they're deployed, whether users can install packages or not. Uh, but there's no third-party software ecosystem for your specific distro unless you create it. Basically, when you do a Yocto build, you can do a, um, a uh, build a, of the SDK for your specific distro. And then that is what a third party, internal or external, could build with. So say that you have a development team that does not want to develop in, the, in using uh, Open Embedded because they don't have the expertise, they don't have the time, they don't have the overhead, they're used to building with a sysroot. You can generate an SDK for your, uh, your baseline platform give it to that other team, they can generate their software product and then run it on top of your BSP. Uh, we've used that internally at Qualcomm. Uh, that's a, a good model to separate um, components when you're doing rapid prototyping. Uh, and there are a couple ways to do these, these SDKs. Um, there's a standard external SDK, which is really just like a sysroot, and then there's this extensible SDK, which has a totally different workflow that lets you uh, build and package your software and be able to upload your recipes into this, um, uh, your basically extend your BSP so that uh, other people can um, basically create extensions that are compatible with your platform. There was a great talk at last year's ELC, uh, which I gave a link for there. How do we do for time? Oh, lots of time. Sorry. So what's the workflow then for, for doing this? When you are using uh, Yocto, you basically create your own layer of recipes um, that are custom. You can take existing recipes and just tweak them slightly using a append file, a BB append file that says, take this recipe, but instead do this or add this patch um, or change this version. Or you can create a whole new recipe and add that in your own layer as well. Uh, so in, in Lenaro's case there, they've created a meta Qualcomm layer that adds Qualcomm specific uh, recipes for things uh, uh, that are specific to that uh, platform. You then need to aggregate all the layers. Is it a Yocto layer, an open embedded layer, an external layer? For instance, there's a meta ROS layer that's available on GitHub that you could then integrate as well. Uh, and then you, you create this bblayers.com file that puts all those layers together and says, here's all the different layers that make up all of the different recipes that I can pull from to build my root file system. You then set up your local.conf file that says, okay, this is the target I'm building, and this is the compile, uh, compilers I'm using, and the target machine, and all my build flags, and if I'm masking any packages and anything else that defines this is how I'm going to make my build. Uh, and then you can build uh, either standard targets that are in Yocto, for instance, like this BitBake uh, core image minimal, or you can define your own uh, images for your specific product, or you can build what are called package groups that define a whole bunch of packages uh, related to, to one thing, and then just build that particular package group. You can also build an individual package uh, if you want to specify that. All right. Um, so that was the workflow for, uh, for Open Embedded. There are some hybrid approaches between Debian and Open Embedded. Uh, there, the, one of them was presented here before. Um, ISAR was something that Siemens uh, had initially started. 
And it basically was <clears throat> a package builder. It was not a distro builder. So it could take any Debian um, derived OS like uh, Debian or MDebian or Ubuntu even, and you could build compatible packages for that distribution using this system, which basically used BitBake and BitBake recipes uh, and used um, all of the, the headers and everything from, from Debian. So it's a way to do a cross build, uh, basically, uh, for Debian. And it let people who are used to creating embedded products with, uh, with Open Embedded and BitBake to do that for a Debian based system. This, uh, I've tried it, I've used it. There were some caveats. I had to run several things as root. Uh, it also maps uh, your device. Um, devices from your kernel into the sysroot, and if you rm minus rf your uh, sysroot, you remove all your devices off your machine, which has happened. Uh, so it's, it's a little fragile, and it's not something that I would have felt comfortable rolling out to people, um, at least at the time that I had used it. There's another one called Debbie, um, which is a, a, a merger of the, the Debian approach to things and the, the Pocky approach to things and it became Debbie. So it is not a package builder. It's basically a distro builder in the sense that you can um, build your own custom distro, but it is using all of the source packages from Debian uh, to do that. And so what's the point? Why would you do that? Basically, you had that five-year five uh, support for all those Debian source packages. So the Debian community is, is uh, committed to supporting those. So if you're creating a product and you need to create your own custom one, and you don't want to rely on the packages in Yocto, which only have a year support, uh, and you want to leverage those, this is a great way to, to figure out how to incorporate that uh, long-term support with your custom platform build. This is what's being looked at from the civil infrastructure project, uh, which is currently based on, on Debbie. Um, and there's, anyway, there's a, a link there to, to more about that. So commercial deployments of, of OE and Yocto. This is kind of why it exists, is for commercial deployment. Uh, it was, Yocto was created from uh, a bunch of commercial companies in the open embedded ecosystem. There was Mentor Graphics, there was, uh, I can't even remember all the different players that were there, Wind River. Uh, and basically, uh, they wanted to, cons to consolidate the directions of, of things and to figure out how to scale and uh, not replicate uh, common activities. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. That's basically why Yocto exists. Um, there's, no dist commercial distro, I would say, from Yocto. Uh, it provides Pocky, which is a reference distro. It's basically, this is how you would put a distro together. Um, and Lenaro uh, doesn't use Yocto per se. They create something called the reference platform build, uh, and Pocky is not part of that. So Yocto, uh, it makes, yeah, as I said, two releases a year, and each release is only supported for one year. Um, uh, which is a challenge uh, for commercially. If you're deploying something that's based on Yocto, you now have to figure out, well, where am I going to get my, my fixes from? Where am I going to get security fixes? How am I going to pipeline those in? Um, who's responsible for that? Can I pay someone to do that? Uh, those are questions you're going to want to answer if you're planning to, to deploy and ever update your, your product. Um, and there are some, some companies that are offering commercial support. Uh, you can buy their, basically their BSP based on Yocto, customized for your hardware, and, and have a support contract through them. So then prototype, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah. Correct, um, so, so let me say, so the same mentor graphics, right? In order for them to have a business and scale, what they would do is they would create a, a distribution, a, re a reference BSP that works across multiple SOCs that basically has a, a common tested platform and then they would do the tweaks to change the kernel for that particular SOC or others and then the incremental difference is basically what you're charging so that it's scalable to charge to different customers. 
it wouldn't be possible for them to create a special Snowflake distro for every different customer and support every one of them for 10 years. It would be phenomenally expensive for, for someone to do that. You do, it's, if you're creating something highly fragmented, it's gonna be very expensive. It all depends. <laughs> yes, true, true, fair enough. So it, 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 certainly the, the more common it is, the more scalable it is. And, and I think that is the point I'm really trying to make. Uh, okay, so for, for planning for productization, uh, some potential gotchas. For, for a lot of Qualcomm platforms, uh, I know that there's um, older compilers used, like a 4.9 compiler to build things. Uh, some of those things are on Qualcomm developer network. And so if you're trying to grab some of that stuff and integrate them into something like a recent version of Debian, you're gonna find uh, that there could be um, some, some challenges uh, involved. Uh, if you have proprietary middle, middleware that you've been using, say that you're using actually Android, uh, so there is an Android build that you could run on a 410C, uh, but it's not something that's commercially supported. It's actually uh, just for, um, for community more. You're gonna find that there were, it's a downstream kernel that has access to, uh, to certain pieces of hardware that are maybe not enabled in the fully upstream build yet. Uh, so just, a, again, something to be aware of if you're, if you've used Android and you're anticipating that all of these things are gonna map over, you wanna check that first. There's uh, pre-built libraries that may have different uh, C++ APIs. So you have the change that happened in GCC 5 where they moved to um, the, the proper C++ 11 uh, ABI and it broke Clang at the time. And, and so there was a lot of issues depending on the compiler that you have through that time frame. There's also people who are using the Android compilers and those versions of them and, and then trying to move to a, uh, an IoT platform that has a much, recent, much more recent compiler. There's a flag that you need to set, <clears throat> basically, uh, to select the ABI that you're using to build and make sure that you're building things that are compatible uh, as you're putting all these, these libraries together. Uh, commercial support and software updates, uh, LTS kernels. Um, basically, if you support an LTS kernel, uh, there was an announcement from Greg Crow Hartman at uh, Linux Foundation about, it was a six year support for five year support. Six years, six years support, yeah, for, uh, for uh, LTS kernels now. And so, um, you know, there's the question of, do you want to stay in a kernel that old versus not? Sometimes you have to, uh, but basically it provides you that, that option. Um, and then, or do you wanna have, so do you have a frozen OS basically? If you chose Yocto and you chose to go with the Morty release, and you're gonna support that for 10 years. Are you gonna support the Morty release on that hardware for 10 years, or are you gonna migrate users from the Morty to the Pyro to the Rocky and, and each thing as it goes on? So you wanna think about how you're, you're going to do updates to your system, uh, given the support, uh, the ways that support is structured uh, for bug fixes and security updates and everything for those platforms. And then open source compliance, uh, what tools do you have? Do you need to provide an XPDX uh, for your, um, uh, um, what is it, for your, your basically stream uh, of deployment or customers who use your product. Supply chain, that's the word I'm looking for. And then on top of all that, if you have a platform, how many third party tools do you want to leverage that um, may or may not be built for your specific custom uh, distro that you make. If you have middleware components uh, that you want to use that m would need to, that say AWS for instance may not be able to target and build custom for every individual BSP, it would depend on the size of the customer and, and those kinds of things. So if you have something like a Debian which is a scalable addressable platform for third parties to create software for, you then have um, a much easier way to roll out third-party packages and support third-party packages on your device and platform. Uh, 
robot operating system, uh, others as well, uh, there can be lots of pain trying to, to incorporate ROS and all its dependencies and everything else into the Yocto platform, especially as it rolls from release to release. Um, for, for Debian, it's basically an app get install. All right. Um, so I wanted to leave you with some useful links. I hope the slides are useful, uh, standalone. Um, but basically, if you want more information on the Dragon Board 410C, uh, there's links off that page to both the Debian and Open Embedded uh, builds for that. There's the Qualcomm Developer Networks page that has lots of different projects that can be done on the 410C. Uh, Debian resources, if you want to find out more information for Debian, uh, there's the support page there. Um, open Embedded, uh, there's a guide on 96 boards, which is very useful, uh, that talks about um, uh, Open Embedded and, and just gives a general overview and then how you can use it on the 96 board platforms. Uh, Yocto it has a, a very extensive developer manual uh, that you, you can get access to there for each of the different releases. Pardon me. And then uh, Aero Electronics is where you would go to uh, get a Dragon Board 410C or any of the accessory boards uh, that are available for it. So thank you very much for coming, and I'll, I'll take some questions. Yeah. So you said, you, you said that um, the Yocto build times, I know, are very long. Yeah. So th there's a trade-off. There's a, there's a break-even point, right? So say that I have 10 packages I have to build. If I have to build 10 packages, way easier to do it in QMU because five times the cost of 10 packages is not the time of building an entire OS from scratch. Uh, one sec. Um, but if you have 100 packages or, or more to build, your, your times start to become almost as long as building the OS from scratch. Depends how much of the OS is your custom stuff and how much of it is, is differentiating. Correct. So the, the question was a, correct. So the, the question was about building a, a single package, and, and that it doesn't take that long to actually build a, a single package. That's that's correct. In that uh, once you've eaten the initial cost of building your BSP, and you have a package, and you want to make a modification, making a modification to a specific package that changes no platform dependencies is relatively quick, and so that's not uh, a big deal once you're you're used to the workflow. If you change anything in that package or you change something in the platform for that package, you are rebuilding the whole platform. Yeah. If you're changing dependencies downstream or in the downstream, then you have to rebuild those dependencies. Right. Correct. Yeah. But the actual, the, the bit bake, bit bake that, that tracks them for you and automatically you know, make sure you don't create things that you don't need. Correct. Yes, yes. Correct, I'll, I'll summarize the comment. So good point in that what Yocto does is it doesn't every time tell you that you have to build the entire uh, distro from scratch again. If you change something, it will track the dependencies of the things you changed and build all the components necessary to do that change. So, correct. So, Right, so the, uh, the device, not, so the Dragon Board is not a 10-year part. The, the chip, the Snapdragon chip and, and that is available for the 10 years. And there's many hardware partners that are making either SOMs or boards related to that. Uh, with software right now, if you're going through uh, Lenaro, there's the Debian build if you want to prototype on something. If you're really going to do, and you could commercialize on that as well. If you want to uh, use Open Embedded, uh, certainly that's uh, another path that you can do. Um, the, 
uh, Lenaro right now updates every time there's a new uh, open embedded release, they'll rebase their uh, open embedded on that. So if you're going to roll with the open embedded releases and you choose open embedded, then, then that's basically your path forward. If you're gonna freeze, then you gotta decide who's gonna do the support for you. So it's, I would not say that it's Qualcomm's issue per se to do that choice. These choices are yours, but, but Correct. Well, anything that's in the upstream kernel that supports that device should not likely be removed from it. Be there's basically like old platforms and, and the maintainers would ask Qualcomm, is anyone using this anymore? Should we remove it or not? If it's already supported in the upstream kernel, it's not going to vanish overnight. Not overnight, but like, I, I work for an SSD vendor and we've seen features of our device go away internally and we have to do backwards. And so I basically yeah. I, no, there's not, I don't think there's a, anyone who's saying th that there's a, a long-term commitment to support something which is already supported. It didn't, I don't think, that if it's supported in the upstream kernel. Yeah. Did you have a question? You're building the tool chain three times. You're building the tool chain, you're building the uh, Canadian Cross tool chain or the, the bootstrap tool chain, and then you're building the tool chain, and then you can build the build. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Uh, 410C? Correct, and it is supported upstream. And it's supported upstream through OpenMax, OpenMA, OpenMA, so. Uh, through um, Video for Linux, V4L2. Through V4L2, but then uh, the decoding, I mean, if I do want to have, like, for for like for a platform, I have requirements to decode video, cast decode, write a cast decoder, and is there support for OpenMax? I believe there are the OpenMax drivers that are in the 410C. Uh, that's, yes, I believe that's true, yes. So it's a, it's a zero copy pipeline that Lenaro's put together for the oh. upstream support for the video core. Okay, that's based on open max. Uh, there's the open, I believe, I believe it's based on the open max IL components wrapped around a Dreamstreamer layer or wrapped around uh, video. Well, I don't want to use Dreamstreamer. So the other parts are there. You can leverage those directly. The neural guys would probably be the best guys to talk to. All right. Is there any other questions, comments, corrections? <laughs> Great. Thank you, everybody, for coming.